I didn't see you all there. How are you doing? Feeling all very sure about your beliefs and choices? Great. I am not. You're probably wondering, where did that comment come from? Of course, I'm sure I am a Christian or Muslim or Jew or atheist. Well, that is fantastic for you, if you really are. But if you thought a bit harder about your beliefs, are you sure you agree with and follow all the aspects of your religion? Where am I coming from, really? Well, it all started from my early teenage years. I remember I kept asking my mum and dad why they treated me differently to my brothers. I basically had much less freedom than my brothers in going to places, doing things, dressing the way I wanted to, course subjects I wanted to study, and friends I wanted to keep, and so on. I was brought up in Iran, you see, but it wasn't because of the Islamic revolution I was being restricted. This kind of practice was customary amongst most Muslim families, even before the revolution. Whenever I asked my dad, even as a child, Dad, why can't I wear shorts like some boys do? Or why can't I go mountain climbing or other adventurous places with my girlfriend without having to take my brother or their brother with us? Or why do you insist I become a teacher or a doctor or a midwife? He would turn around and just say, because they are boys, they are different. Be grateful that I'm not forcing you to wear a hijab as some other dads do. I'm not forcing you to become a teacher or a midwife. I'm only saying that girls are more suited for those types of professions. How about a pharmacist or a physiotherapist? Do you prefer that better? The point was, I didn't like those professions. Although I liked the idea of becoming a teacher, and I was one for a while, but that is not the point. I knew I had other talents, and I didn't agree that some professions were better for women and some for men. How about you? Do you all have the jobs and professions now that you dreamed of having when you were a child? What happened if you're not? Come on, be honest. You don't have that dream job now because at least partly your mum or dad kept saying, what, you want to become a pilot? There are no women pilots. I'm sure, at least not Muslim ones. Or, you want to become a surgeon? Becoming a surgeon takes many years. You can't get married and have a family. And then it will make you an old maid. You need to be a good mother and a good wife. The same as all your good Muslim friends and cousins. Let's carry on with my story. My father came home one day and called me to show me a piece of news on the newspaper. See what they do to those poor girls and women in Afghanistan? Be thankful that over here we don't force you to stay at home all the time and only go out with a male relative and wear those strange blue tents covering your face as well. <laughs> and I said, yes, Dad. Thank you for not imprisoning me at home and not putting me inside one of those tents, as you say. But I don't know why I should cover myself up when boys and my brothers don't. He then said, because they are men. And the Quran asks women to cover themselves up, although it asks men to dress modestly too. And we are Muslims. I used to get really annoyed at boys running or walking around free as a bird when me and my girlfriends had to wear a long scarf, thick dresses to cover ourselves up, especially in the heat of the summer. Some of my friends who wore the chadar, you know, the long one piece cloth which covers the whole head and body, had quite a hard time going around doing their chores and holding up their chadars. I couldn't go swimming in outdoor pools or attend lots of other sports because of having to cover our bodies. Why don't men divert their gazes rather than me covering myself up? I thought several times in those days. 
do you? The ladies in the hijabs especially. Do you ever get annoyed at men or boys for not having to cover themselves up and act freely as they like? Perhaps not. Perhaps you are just better at following the rules. Don't get me wrong. I do like a lot of things about Islam, like promoting science and the equality of all races and people from any class, any financial background, but could not always agree with what it said about women. Although my dad said a few times, the Quran came to the almost barbaric Saudi Arabians at a time when they buried their babies alive if they were girls. It was a very revolutionary religion at the time, asking them not to kill their daughters. I agree with all that, but what about now? How about women in Saudi Arabia only just earning the right to drive about a year ago, for God's sake? I think to myself at times that at least Iran wasn't that restrictive about women's professions. They were female lawyers, doctors, artists, all types. But it still wasn't good enough for me. They all had to wear a hijab, not through choice, but by law, and had difficulties in choosing and getting promoted in their careers. My dad also told me one time about how witnessing and reporting a crime was treated unequally between men and women. What? I said, he explained that there needed to be two to four women to provide statements, which could equate the statement of one man? I can't believe this. Can you believe it? I know many women, including myself, whose statements would just be as clear, subjective and intelligent of any man's. How would you feel if you'd witnessed a crime? Say a rape or an assault. And when you go to provide a statement, the authorities said, well, all that is well and good, but is there another woman or man who witnessed that? No, it was just you who saw it. Well, sorry, we can't do anything about that then. Let's just see it as it is. We are being treated almost as children, or mentally incapable people, not thinking as adults. Then my beloved dad passed away when I was still a teenager, and I found out that a daughter would receive half as much as a son in inheritance. That is just the way Islam had advised. It was a good advice many decades ago, I thought, when women didn't work and men had to provide for them as husbands. So it would be fair for boys to, see, to receive more than girls. But what about now? What if a girl didn't ever get married? Or what if they were working as much as men did? Some years later, I found out about the evil practice of honour-based killing. When I read the news about Shafila Ahmed, the Pakistani British girl who was killed by her parents in 2003, because apparently she'd become too westernised. Was this Islam? I remembered asking myself then. Do you think this is what Islam would advocate? Surely isn't. Islam doesn't preach parents killing their daughters for their choices. It is well documented and reported that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, treated his daughter Fatima and his wife Khadija with great respect. But it does say in the Quran that if your wives misbehave, you can beat them a little until they change their behavior. I remembered it was mostly women who were stoned, but also a few men who had committed adultery in Iran some years ago. Was this practice completely Islamic? I recall my father saying that proving adultery the way it was in the Quran is extremely hard. 
it needs a few people to have actually witnessed the act of adultery. And so the punishment of stoning didn't seem to be feasible in reality. I know we should also defend Islam when it is due. For example, there are lots of monstrous acts that are unfairly connected to Islam, like FGM. It has nothing to do with Islam. Its origins go back to the pharaohs in Egypt, for God's sake, way before Islam appeared. I think to myself at times that Islam seems to have drawn the short straw in some hidden competition between religions, since no one seems to mention the gender inequalities arising from Catholicism or Judaism. Now, after all this is said and done, do you think all these inequalities are really Islam's fault? Or is it a male tendency to dominate, control, and at times abuse females? So he has interpreted religious texts to suit his wishes. Is it a blame which should be shared amongst religions, men and some women? Women who conspire with dominating men? Many years have passed since those days of my conversation with my father. And if I could, I would say to him, Dad, I treasure all that I learned from you. I miss even our heated discussions, but I have had to make lots of choices in my life. Some good, some not so good, but they were my choices. And I have tried to follow my religion and culture, but a version of them, which has moved on with time. After all, I'm living in the 21st century Scotland not in the deserts of 7th century Arabia. I'm sure you would want me to be happy. So that's me. How about you? Scene opens on a beauty salon. Two dark leather chairs center stage face out towards the audience. There is a long counter in front of chairs littered with brushes, spray bottles, magazines and hair dryers. On the right hand side of the stage is a desk with a till on it, a big red appointment book and a fan that has been switched on. There are three chairs lined up on the left hand side of the stage. Only the middle chair is empty. The other two have magazines on them. Jackie, a woman in her 60s is sitting in one of the chairs, leaning far back. She sits very still with her eyes closed. Sersha is slowly circling Jackie, staring at her. Safi, moving quickly, is attempting to tidy up the counter. Saf, do you think she's dead? Hmm? Yeah, maybe. Maybe it's this heat that's killed her off. <laughs> What's the opposite of hypothermia? Sersha crouches and checks her breathing with a mirror. God, it's hot. Yeah. Do you know we've been open for 12 years? 12 years today. It feels like a special number. Like a, like a dozen eggs. 12 months in a year. The 12 disciples of Jesus. Yeah, but one of them was Judas. The dirty dozen? Well, Jesus Christ! What's your mouth, Sir Shariley, taking the Lord's name in vain? We thought you were asleep. I know what you thought. Just because I'm old doesn't mean I'm deaf or da. Waving your mirror at me. Don't look dead to you. Loud mobile ringtone sounds. God, that's the fifth time that's gone off. Who is it? 
It's it's just James. Again. I'll I'll call back later. So? What? Is it true then, Saf? (laughs) Don't pretend. I know. Cara told Anna, who told Katie, who told me. You did Cara's uh, hair at your house last night. He's spying on me. God, I, I can't believe you. I never spied on you. Yeah, you did. Whenever you thought I was being too friendly with anyone else in our year, you'd get all jealous and weird, whispering in the girls' bathroom trying to find out who I was talking to. For God's sake, Saf, this is serious. We're not at school anymore. I need to know I can trust you. We need to be honest with each other. Oh, well, that's rich coming from you. What? You didn't come into work last week. I told you I was ill. You were a bit vague about it. I had food poisoning. Nothing vague about that. Still, you've been really off lately. I know something's up, but you're always late coming in these days, and I'm sure you've worn that same top the last few days in a row. (laughs) What are you, the laundry police? I forgot to put a load on, so what? I don't know, it's just... It's not like you. And what about you? Taking clients away from our business, aren't you? And that's not like you either. Hogging all the big spenders, keeping them for yourself. What happened to our promise? We were supposed to share everything 50-50. It's not like that. I... Dude, you two just carry on. I'll just wait here till you're done. Just read a magazine. I'll be there in a minute. Read them? They're all 10 years old. Didn't you bite my arse with them? Saf, you know we're losing money here. If we don't work hard and work together, we'll lose everything. Please tell me you're not stealing clients. How is it stealing? If they ask specifically for me, I'm supposed to say no. I've got two kids to support. I'm the one that will lose everything. If we go bust, you and James will still be living the good life with your big house and your matching Mercedes. But what about me? If we go under, then I'm broke. Back to the narrow scraping life on universal credit. I, no, I'm, I'm not doing that again. I, I can't. It's a struggle enough as it is. This isn't just a nice little hobby for me. Like it is for me, you mean? Oh, of course. I forgot. My life's perfect. I didn't mean... I forget it. Sarsha goes back to Jackie and starts aggressively putting rollers in her hair. Saki returns to the empty chair and starts brushing up hair from her last client. We are picking up, though. No, things are improving. What are you talking about? I mean, look at this place. We're empty. What am I? Chop me? (laughs) We're dead. I've never felt better. So don't tell me we're doing okay, okay? Come on, it's it's not as bad as... (laughs) Someone's coming in soon. For the ultimate. What's that? The ultimate? Are you joking? I'm going to tell me what it is. It's the most expensive treatment we offer. The ultimate party package. Hair, makeup, spray tan, nails, lashes. It's the first time anyone has ever booked it. You never told me. When did the call come in? It was an online booking. Who is it? I don't actually... Oh, for God's sake, Saf. Well, you know how hard that thing is to figure out? You won't even touch it. Sometimes it's fine, but other times... I I couldn't get access to the page with all the personal details on it. Maybe it's the Queen? Or or Megan. I better not be. Or Kate? Oh, wouldn't that be fabulous? Can you imagine? Yeah, because that lot are always hanging around this end of Glasgow. It's the bookies and the chippy down the road that draw them in every time. Not to mention the widows boozing it up in the corner. So we don't even know this person's name. What are we supposed to call her? Your Highness would probably do. The salon door opens and two people enter the back of the shop. And when were you going to tell me, Saf? I was only booked in last night. And it's in the appointment book. Not that you ever bother looking in. Yeah, you too. Oh, don't start that again. Oh yeah, yeah, because what's the point? You're supposed to check the book regularly, but you never bother, do you? It always has to be me. Listen! 
When were you going to tell me about this? Well, I'm telling you now, aren't I? Wonderful! Brilliant! I'm surprised you even bothered booking her in here. You could have just done her treatments at home and kept all the money for yourself. You know, twist the knife in the back even deeper. I've had it with you. You and you are a complete and utter... You two, shut up. You've got a customer. Dersha and Safi turn quickly to see Asma, a figure dressed in black from head to toe. He's wearing a long black abaya, black hijab, black niqab and black gloves. Her mother is standing behind her, a small old woman dressed in shawar kameez, hijab, sensible shoes, and a massive handbag. The older woman sits down on the middle chair against the back wall. She picks up a tattered hello and starts to read. Asma surveys the room as if checking something. She nods at her mother and removes her niqab and gloves. Hi, my name's Asma Chaudhary. I have an appointment. No, you're not in here. Are you sure? Could you check again? It's Asma Chaudhary. You've made a mistake. No one of that name in our book. But it must be there. I made the appointment online last night. It's for the ultimate party package. You're hanging us. <laughs> you? You booked that appointment? Yes. Yes, that's right. Of course you did. My name's Safi. I'll be looking after you today. If you'd like to take a seat, we can get started. Thanks. Safi ushers her towards the empty seat next to Jackie. So, uh, we'd normally start off with the uh, spray tan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but obviously if I don't need that. It was quite a good offer, so I thought I'd book it and just skip that part. Right, so we can start off with your hair. Could you just... You look so familiar. Yes, we've met, haven't we, at where, where, where did you meet her? At the bank. I work there part-time and... Uh, yeah, right, I've uh, seen you there sometimes when I'm in. Safi helps Asma into a black gown. You work in a bank? Ah, uh, yes. The customers must think there's a hold-up if you're behind the desk, you know, with... All that gear on. But the knees are it. Of course. What? Look, she knows I'm just having a laugh, will not you, Anna? My name's Asma. Thought I had asthma once. Turned out I was just having a panic attack. I just want to check before I take off my hijab. There won't be any men coming in here, will there? That depends. Hey, Jackie, any of your young studs turning up here today? No, you're fine. Here, let me take that for you. Asma removes her hijab and her long hair falls down her back. I wanted uh, something like this. Sure, yeah, I can do that. Do you have a boyfriend then? <laughs> nah, she's just winding me up. Man. Done with them. They're all dogs. Surely not all of them. All of them? Dogs. They're completely adorable with big eyes and shiny coats. Nah, they piss everywhere. And they need constant attention and they're out for anything they get. What about Dr. Reynolds? You were always saying how well he looks after you. What a good doctor he is. Aye, he is a good doctor. Apart from how he's always trying to get a look at my knickers. Doba, doba, I still got a laugh. Hey, I still got it, you know. I've had many young men make a fool of himself or me. I don't doubt it, Jackie. You're a right stunner, so you are. <laughs> Enough of your sweet talking. You missed a bit. Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Is that him? Oh, just a bit of a poem I read once. A bit a wee bit of Pakistani poem, then? No, it's my Angelou. Oh, she doesn't need sound Pakistani. No, no, she's not. She she was American. I well, no wonder. They're all obsessed with sex, aren't they? The Yanks. You were married though, weren't you, Jackie? Then they remind me. What was he like? 
Mahari. He drank himself today. It's a bit of relief, to be honest. It sounds rotten, but you could be a bit of a lion. Sometimes. I'm not proud of this mind. But instead of helping him, you know where his problem and that. And what well, egg him on. You know, fancy a drink, Harry. Not to kill him, mind. Just to get him out of my way for a wee bit. Because he, he was drinking. That'd be him busy. And I know have to listen to his tired old patter about his friend that were all deed and about the priest of petrol going up. And... So by the time the funeral comes along, I'm, I'm there feeling guilty. I had a bit of money, you know, stashed away, and I really wanted to get my boobs done. But then I thought, I'll need to spend it on the funeral. Give a proper send off, and you should have heard them. Those mad funeral salesmen. Give me the right hard sale. Will you know half this for him? Will you know half that for him? I was so fed up with it. And besides, I was no having him rot in the grunt. So I had him cremated. But honestly, choosing that, aren't it? It was an ordeal. I tell you. Should I just put him in one of his old beer cans? He would have liked that. At the end of it all, what am I left with now? No husband and no boobs. And I feel like screaming at him. But I can't, because he's dead. Daddy. Jackie looks over at Asma's mum. I take it your uh, mum will be picking out a nice man for you to marry soon? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not ready for that. I'm still at uni. But you must be meeting a guy tonight. Don't worry, we won't tell on you. No. What makes you think that? Well, you're getting your hair done, makeup, nails. It must be a big night. It's just a get together with my friends. One of them's moving down south, and I just thought it'd be nice to have a wee party, give give her a nice wee send off, and there'll be no guys there at all. Nope. So. You're getting dressed up because, because I feel like it. Right. You get fed up wearing all that. Sorry, I hope you don't mind me asking. No, no, it's fine. Um, I'm just used to it, I suppose, although lately it has been bothering me a bit. No wonder, I couldn't stand it. Not being seen, not being able to communicate, express myself properly. That's not it. I can communicate fine. It's just, well, you feel invisible as a person. No, the exact opposite, really. I feel too visible. Lately, I've had a few guys approaching me, chatting me up. Some men find women in the cab mysterious, alluring. But the whole point of me wearing it is to avoid all of that. See? What I mean, dogs. What, so you don't want men to be attracted to you? That's right. Well, you've come to the right salon, hen. <laughs> but why? Because, well, that's just physical attraction to my body, my face, the way I look. But that's not what defines me. That's not what makes me, me. I'm so much more than that. We all are. Oh, no. Uncle Gas and Jerry, you. Men don't care about all that, do they? God, would you just stop it, Jackie? You're such a... What's the word? Misandrist. What? Misandrist. Someone who hates men. I didn't hate him. It's just half them can't be trusted and the other half that can are completely bloody useless. You've just had bad experiences, I think. Yeah, not wrong, were you? My husband was a good man. He, he was wonderful, caring, kind. Oh, he was so funny. Never cheated on you? Of course not. Right, as far as you know. Excuse me? Nothing, nothing. You didn't forget your husband, Sir Shaf. What do you mean? Well... 
James is obviously one of the good ones, isn't he? Lavishes all that attention on you. He's been calling you constantly these days. What was Was that? Sorsha, this isn't working. You need to get rid of her. Who, who was? It's just Lizzie. She's waxing in the back room. You do have a back room. Just Lizzie is a psychopath. You need to fire her. I can't fire her. She's my sister-in-law. Besides, she's just passionate about what she does. You mean the cupboard? Passionate? She's totally mental. She'd whack you to within an inch of your life if she could. But do you think we should check on the client? Call an ambulance? I didn't think she'd be waxing people on the cupboard. She'll be fine. She's probably just got a low pain threshold. Uh, Lizzie, I love that sadistic cow. Honestly, it needs to stop so she's mental. Well, at least she's bringing the money in. Right, Mum. Come on, we're going. I'm not done yet. Well, would you hurry up? Do you really have to come here so often? It's such a pain having to come all the way here and pick you up. And what do they really do? Your hair looks the same all the time. Honestly, what a waste of money. You two could be ashamed of yourselves, taking money off a pensioner, money she doesn't have. Convince her this needs done that and he's done con artists. The period. Ah! Uh, who the hell's that? The it's hell? a Brazilian. Right. I'm not waiting here. I'll be in the car. Sersha gives Jackie's hair a final spray and shows her the back of it with a mirror. Ain't it? When you're young, the future seems so exciting. And you find out you're in the family way and your heart bursts for happiness because you've never had anything that was truly yours before. And you see him for the first time. Heart swells with joy to see his tiny little boy so helpless, so frail, came from you, that fed from your strength. And, and time passes, and you work and you sweat and you worry until finally your son's a man. You're no longer young, no longer strong. Your body is shrunk and starts betraying itself little by little every day. Do you feel the same as you did back then, all those years ago? In your heart, you're still the same person. No one can see that anymore. When a man gets ill, he gets respected, distinguished, wise, a true gent. A man who just a wee old woman whose dreams died a long time ago. Nobody can see past it. Asma's mum gets up and puts a hand on Jackie's arm. Doctor Shah. Man. <laughs> you not. At the doctor's, this beauty salon. Yes, I know. I'm introducing myself. My name is Dr. Shah. You need to stick up for yourself. He is your son. He shouldn't speak to you like that. Children should respect their parents. And you? May I? She gently reaches for Sersha's arm and pulls her sleeve up, revealing a number of bruises. I'm so sorry. This isn't your fault, you know. There are so many places you can go for help. What? Sersha, what's going on? Is it your man? Did he do that? How did... How did you know? Sad to say, but I see it far too often. You're wearing long sleeves on such a hot day. He called you many times in one day. And I saw the faint abrasions back there. You all think that I'm loaded, but it was always James that had the money, never me. He never gave me a penny. 
he's always been the jealous type and I used to like that about him. It made me feel special, but then it got worse. He'd say horrible, vile things and watch me constantly. But it was fine. It wasn't his fault. He was just so stressed with his business. Things weren't going well and I wanted to help him be supportive. Then he lost it all, went bankrupt. And it just got so much worse. Why? Why didn't you tell me? Saf, if I were to ask you to describe me, what would you say? What, what do you mean? Oh, just tell me. How would you describe me? I don't know. Mad. Loud and confident funny. Yeah, because you know me. You know who I am. But if I told anyone, even you, then all of that disappears. It's another piece of me gone. I'm just this sad cow that lets her husband get away with it all. And I don't even know who I am anymore. You're Sersha Riley and you're going to get it in. I'm so sorry, Sersha. We're going to get you through this. You can stay at mine, okay? Or mine, hen. Dr. Shah takes Sersha's hand. Mum, come on! Press off. Right. I think maybe we should go. No, wait. I've not done your treatments yet. Another day, perhaps. Here is my number. And if you need any help or support, you're not alone. Listen. Thanks for... You know, not saying anything. Of course. No problem. I just want you to know I've always paid my own way until now. I'm working all hours, but things still seem to... What I mean is I never thought I would have to rely on... Please. You really don't have to explain. Of course you work hard. There's no shame in getting help when you need... When you need to... It's, it isn't your fault. I've seen some things working at the food bank and you realise it can happen to anyone. Yeah. Thanks. Dr. Shah and Asma leave. Safi stands staring after them. Jackie sits down on the chair left empty by Dr. Shah, and Sersha starts putting away the curlers. I can't believe she left without her treatments. I know. Rude, I thought. Pretty girl, though. Anna, I suppose. She would be all that get up, though. Thanks, Rude. She'd only find a man like that. Asma. Her name's Asma. I thought I had asthma lands. Turned out to be just a bit indigestion. Stupid cow. She shouldn't be dressed like that. This isn't India. I thought you were from Pakistan. Oh, same thing. Trouble is, they won't integrate. Aye, true enough. What? Nothing. It's nothing. Two identical women are lying in bed sleeping. One is curled up in the fetal position, face buried in the pillows and duvet. The other is lying rigidly on her side. They are in their early 20s and are of mixed Arabic heritage. Their name is Farah Ahmed. A phone alarm goes off. Rigid Farah stirs, turns it off and goes back to sleep. Three minutes later, a more urgent alarm sounds. Rigid Farah turns it off again. Right, we've got five more minutes, then we absolutely need to get ready. Sleepy Farah groans unmoving. The final alarm sounds. Rigid Farah turns it off 
and sits up in a springly manner, rubbing her eyes. Right. Up. Now. Oh. Rigid Farah huffs and slowly starts to push sleepy Farah out of bed. Oh, leave me alone. Let's just stay in bed. We can't stay in bed. This audition is important, so come on, up. We've got a 7.14 train to catch. It's so dark outside. And we hate trains. We have to take a train just to catch this bloody train. Oh, it's not fair. How many other auditionees have to get up at 5 a.m. for a 2 p.m. audition? God, it's an absolute car up. Oh, I'm sure they refuse self-tapes from lots of other people. And Bella. Or just the people they weren't already friends with. Come on. We know that's just part of the business that we're in. Yeah, but it really should be. It doesn't have to be. Bridget Farah grabs Sleepy Farah by the wrists and begins to drag her out of bed. You're the worst. Scene two. Rigid Farah stands in front of a mirror, putting makeup on her face with a makeup sponge. Sleepy Farah sits with her legs crossed on the floor and her head in her hands. Remember, not too much foundation. It'll make you look too white. Mm, mm, mm. And don't use too much of that concealer either. Maybe more bronzer instead. Arabs aren't supposed to be white to these people, remember? Well, maybe we could just educate them by looking like ourselves. Yeah, because that's what these people want, to be educated. Rigid Farah turns her heels back to the mirror and begins to fill her eyebrows a little thicker and darker than they actually are. Sleepy Farah sits back on the floor. Scene three. Rigid Farah is standing at a train station ticket machine. Sleepy Farah is looking over her shoulder. Hurry up. There are people waiting. They're watching you. They're wondering why you can't type that reference number faster. Tickets begin to print. Our ticket is ready. Hurry up, get moving. Ticket is out. Walk and zip, walk and zip. The Farahs make their way onto a train. 26A, be on the lookout for 26A. Please be empty, please be empty. Ah, here it is. Hi, I think that's me at the window. He better not be a man spreader. He better not be a man spreader. Oh. Great, he's a fucking man spreader. He better not be here all the way to fucking London. Scene four. Farah stands on a tube platform waiting for the next train. Rigid Farah is wearing headphones. Let's move up the platform. I don't want to stand where everyone else will be getting on. When it's this busy, it won't make much of a difference. They walk up the platform and the train arrives. They get on it, and it is a bit of a tight squeeze. I can hear that guy's music over hours. Everyone is looking at us funny. They can tell we're not from here. How many stops do we have? And what if no one moves to let us off and we miss it? Oh, oh God, that girl's bag keeps tapping my fucking leg. Scene five. The Farahs approach a front desk in an office. I am here for the addition. What's your name? It's Farah Ahmed. Mm -hmm. Right. The waiting area is off to your right. The bathrooms are to your left. Should you need them, the panel are running about 45 minutes behind, but they will call you when they're ready. <sighs> Typical. I told you we didn't need to get here half an hour early. We could have had an extra hour and 15 in bed. What if we fuck this now because we're tired? We won't. We just say, Bismillah, Ir Rahman, Ir Rahim, and we do it. Scene six. Rigid Farah is standing in front of an audition panel with a man and a woman on it. They're looking down at their notebooks and whispering <laughs> to each other. They have a camera set up on their table recording the auditions. 
Sleepy Farah stands in the corner of the room, watching. Right, um, to start with your name, the role you're auditioning for, and then in your own time, start. Woo! Hi, my name is Farah Ahmed. I'm auditioning for the role of refugee number four. The community centre is the most welcoming place we have been. Right, uh, let's do that one more time. Uh, this time, can you lean into the accent a bit more? And perhaps take your time, because the character wouldn't be that confident in their English. Simultaneously though, I want you to really push that natural fire and grit your people have. Yeah, because after a year of being in Britain, I'd struggle with one sentence too. <clears throat> The community centre is the most welcoming place we have been. Oh, good God. I hope you're proud of yourself. Right. Um, thank you for coming in, Farah. I believe that's all we need today. Today? Does that mean that you need me to come back another day? Sorry, I'm, I'm afraid not. I'm we're looking for someone who is a bit more authentically Arabic, and we don't feel you're quite Arab enough for the role. Not Arab enough. <laughs> Not Arab enough. We are Arab. We have an Arabic name. We speak Arabic. We were born and raised in the Middle East in an Arab country to a largely Arab family. We didn't even move to this God-forsaken country until we were 18. Although we aren't Arab enough for you. Who were you expecting? Omar Sharif. Just because we don't fit your rigid, geographically misplaced Fox News version of an Arab, guys, our skin too light, our hair not dark enough, do Arabs need more of an accent for you? Should we have tutted at your Western clothes? Because God knows, only in Britain do people go about in shorts and vests when it's overcast and 15 degrees outside. God, better get your SPF 50 ready or you'll be the shade of a spanked lobster by the end of the day, although you'll still call it a tan. But no... No, no, we should have walked in and said, Mashallah, what good weather we are having. Should we have brought you some falafel or hummus? Because if we see another white person dip a used knife into a tub of hummus and spread it on bread like butter, you'll see some of that Arab fire that you want so bad. Farah, I swear to God, you better say something. Anything. Thank you for your time. Sleepy Farah rolls her eyes and collapses onto the ground. Rigid Farah picks up her handbag and coat. She then picks up Sleepy Farah and carries her on her back like a backpack. They leave the room. Scene seven. Rigid Farah sits on a return train. Sleepy Farah is unconscious on her lap. The train is busy and loud. Rigid Farah gets an incoming call. Uh, don't tell me the truth. You could just disappoint them more. Hello, Baba. Shai Falik. Mm hmm. Traffic, as always. No, I'm on the train back from London. Yeah, that was today. I went okay. I feel good about what I did. Best Madri. I'll find out soon, I think. Yes, I said Bismillah, Ir Rahman, Ir Rahim before going in. Yani, for these things, it could be any reason that they go with someone else. Raish? La Baba, my bye. Excuse me, miss. Could you please lower your voice and finish up your phone call? Why? We've had some complaints. It's making some of the other passengers uneasy. Uneasy how? Look, 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 miss. I've told you once. Don't fight me on this. You people should really know that you can't be saying Allah this and Allah that on public transport. 
<laughs> Look, now we're at enough. 